Hello, friends. It's the Adam Ragusea podcast, episode 82, I think. And we're trying a new thing. I'm in the greenhouse on a 9 a.m. local time, uh, Eastern Standard Time or Daylight? I can never remember. Eastern Time, 9 a.m., my time, Eastern U.S. time. Uh, doing a live chat on YouTube, and we will sort of talk about whatever we want to talk about for the next hour or so. Um, I have the chat open, <laughs> and people are there. And if people want to talk about things, they can. Um, the chat will be archived so that if people who are listening on the on the on uh, an actual podcast app want to just go on YouTube and look at the chat, uh, you can. <laughs> it could get interesting this time because the title of this episode is "On Knives and Gaza." On knives and Gaza. Okay. Um, before we get to what you want to say, I'm going to talk about what I want to say. So uh, I was sitting here at the house the other day, and I got a, a text from uh, your friend and mine, J. Kenji Lopez Alt. Kenji, good, good man, good, good internet cook, internet cook of the world, the internet cook we all aspire to be. And Kenji called me and he said, I'm working on, uh, I think he said a New York Times piece about like knives and knife sharpness and sort of what what normal people should aspire to do with their knives at home. What kind of knife should you have? How good should it be? How expensive? Uh, you know, how you should sharpen it, that kind of stuff. And since I have some rather <laughs> outspoken comments on the record on that topic, um, I he thought that he would call me and just sort of, you know, not 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 necessarily. I think I don't think all of it was really intended to be on the record, but he was just trying to sort of work out his own thoughts for his own piece about knives and what people home cooks should do about knives, knife sharpness and knife use, knife technique, knife safety, all that kind of stuff. So what I said to Kenji, and this is uh, where <laughs> you're going to you're going to understand where the title of this episode comes from on knives and Gaza. So what I said to Kenji was that I said, you know, it seems to me that conversations about like knives and knife sharpness tend to proceed in a way that is rhetorically similar to conversations about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the sense that like many topics around which passions are very high, people tend to proceed from a place of what they want to be true, not what is true, right? They tend to, these conversations tend to proceed from what the speaker wants to be true, not what actually is true. And in the case of Israel-Palestine, <laughs> very easy for an, a mostly uninvolved outsider to say, but it seems to me that one of the many core problems at play here is that People don't accept that there are millions of people with a multi-generational claim to this general area of territory, and they all need to live there, and they all need to find a way to share it. And we who live around them, and we who <laughs> directly and enormously financially and militarily support one of the parties in this conflict, those of us who are involved in that sense need to proceed from the assumption that all of these people deserve to live, deserve to exist, and that they all have some degree of legitimate claim to the territory on which they sit, as we all do. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. Unless you are prepared to just kill everyone you disagree with. I mean, just wipe them all off the map. Unless you are ready to do that, you have to learn to live with the people who live around you. And we may get into some more specifics if anyone cares what Adam Ragusea thinks about the Israel-Palestine Israel conflict. I may give you a few specific thoughts. In fact, I have a few I'm going to give you soon. Because I do think that it is incumbent upon me to offer some. And I, I've been struggling so hard with like how, how to talk about it. 
um, that I, I've just decided that I just have to run headlong into it and do a live at nine in the morning. So here we are, because now I'm committed. I'm pot committed, have to keep going. So the reason that I made this comparison to Kenji about knives and the is Israel-Palestine conflict is that um, I also think that like when sort of knife nerds, people who are love their kitchen knives and care for them and want other people to learn to love their knives as much as they do. I think that they feel very passionately and trained cooks, trained chefs feel very passionately about knives and knife use because it's such an intimate tool. It's, it's extension of your body when this is what you do for a living, right? That it's so important to them that they can't accept what is true about us, people who cook at home, which is that it's extremely, extraordinarily unlikely that all of us are going to learn how to use the claw technique, which is that technique where the side of the knife literally touches your knuckles and you kind of cut with the knife actually touching and being stabilized against the knuckles of your stabilizing hand, right? And this is this thing that like everyone in kind of Western style restaurants uh, learns how to do you know, kind of classical culinary education, because if you do it properly, uh, it's theoretically impossible to cut yourself, or maybe you could maybe shave off a little bit of skin right on the knuckle, but you couldn't really like lose a digit if you do it this way, assuming you do it basically the, the way that it's supposed to be done is, uh, not something that I can really do. I'm not, I'm not a trained chef of any kind, not my thing. And I, I have been lucky enough to see like lots and lots of incredibly talented grandmas cook, like really, really talented people who have just, you know, women who have been in the kitchen cooking their whole lives and could just kick the ass of me and probably most of the people here in the chat, right? For this live podcast edition of the Adam Ragusea podcast, episode 82, where we were talking about knives and casa. <laughs> in a very tenuous metaphor. Go with me. So um, people care a lot about their knives. I've seen incredibly talented grandmas, people who have been cooking informally, but very, very well their whole lives. Lots of them. None of them use the claw. The claw technique is a technique that purely comes out of the Western restaurant tradition and has spread thusly. And it's a good thing. I'm not challenging it, but I've never, ever, ever seen someone who didn't come out of that tradition use it or anything like it. And yet they are able to cook incredibly well. So first, I think that, you know, knife nerds who are who insist upon the claw as really the only viable technique need to. <laughs> need to look at themselves and ask themselves, do you really want to look at that incredibly talented cooking grandma and tell her that she shouldn't be, that like she's doing it wrong? <laughs> Are you going to do that, dude? Like, let's, I'll, 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 I would like to film that. Can I film that when that happens? When you tell her that she's doing it wrong? Let's watch. It's going to be great. Right? Uh, so, any conversation about knife and knife safety and kitchen knives has to proceed from, from reality, right? Which is that most people don't do this. And I think it's very unlikely that lots of people will ever do this because this is a hard thing to do. It takes a lot of this claw. To, I'm sorry for the people who are listening to the podcast as they're supposed to be doing, because it's a podcast. I'm demonstrating the claw technique right here visually. Um, when you do this, um, you, you have to hold your food with your fingertips instead of the pads of your fingers, which is not the way our hands are evolved to like hold stuff, or, or at least not big things. Small things were evolved to hold with the tips of our fingers, but big things like food, we hold it with uh, the pads of our fingers. It's just what we're evolved to do, right? And then we're also evolved, I think, to <laughs> keep our body and our parts away from dangerous things like knives. Like we have this instinctive des desire to recoil away from the knife and not have our stabilizing hand right up against it. So it's just, it's just a deeply unnatural thing. And I just don't think it's realistic to expect that most people will ever do it. Um, and I'm not even sure that if most people tried to do it, that would be a good thing for public safety, right? Because I'm not sure how viable it is for people to learn how to do that 
outside of the context of a professional kitchen where they're being apprenticed, right? And that they could end up doing more harm than good. And I have no idea. But I know that it's unrealistic to expect that most people will cut that way. Therefore, you have to and then engage with the question, what do you want to do instead as like an as like an internet cook as you could you could very grandiosely describe it as a a cooking educator of some kind right what do you do if you accept as a reality that most people are not going to learn how to use the claw technique what do you do i think what you do is you try to demonstrate and preach practices that allow people to cut safely and well without using the claw, which for me is mostly just like stabilizing the food. However, feels natural to you. Put your whole hand down on it. If you want, just keep your stabilizing hand way away from the knife. Just keep it really far away from the knife and go slowly, go really slow. Keep the stabilizing hand away from the knife as much as possible. And I have been criticized on the internet very much for that because, you know, people will say, oh, look, it's one thing to not have the technique. It's another thing to be proud of not having the technique and to preach to others that they eschew the technique as well and just do your dumb thing. And that's, that's on its face, I think, a cogent argument, but it just doesn't sort of fit with the facts of the situation, which are, as we have recounted, that most people do not use the claw. And I would assert that most people never will use the claw. That is simply the reality that we live in. And given that those facts, I think the best thing to do is to uh, just, uh, you know, cut things normal, like the way most people in the world do it and to try to do it as slowly and safely as possible. What does that have to do with Gaza and Israel, Palestine? Well, a lot of people around me, a lot of people in my orbit. Uh, does bro not see the chat? Someone is asking me. No, I'm I'm not paying attention to the chat right now. I'm thinking about my thoughts. Uh, <laughs> so what does this have to do with Gaza? I, a lot of people in my orbit, which includes me, we're struggling with how to morally size up the, the war as it ha is happening. Struggling with who is ultimately morally culpable, both for the immediate conflict and also the root conflict of which the immediate conflict is merely the most recent phase. Struggling with morality, and it's tricky. I, I'm really not sure who I think is more to blame for the horror unfolding. At least in the broad sense, in the immediate sense, I have some pretty good ideas about who I want to blame. Not a big fan of Bibi Netanyahu. But in the long, in the broad historical sense, I'm really not sure who is most culpable for the horror unfolding in West Asia at the moment other than maybe the British, like if you wanted to like point at one actor who's really most responsible, it's the British Empire. Um, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. My wife, who is was born in the South, um, the, the, the American South, um, has this, well, no, she was born, uh, oh, she was born in the North, but she was raised in the South because she was a military kid. Anyway, complicated. Raised in the South. So Lauren has this expression that she pulls out sometimes that's this kind of like wonderful Southern mom expression, which is don't borrow trouble. And what it means is um, don't, par don't borrow trouble. When something isn't really a problem that you have to deal with, don't worry about it. Like don't, that's somebody else's problem or that's your problem, you know, s further down the road. But for right now, if it's not something you need to deal with right now, don't think about it. Don't borrow trouble, right? So the moral quandary that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict presents someone like me is, at least in a moment like this, I think, trouble that I don't have to borrow. Meaning that I, I don't have to decide who's more to blame. Because I, I am a party to the conflict. I am a citizen of the United States. I am a wealthy citizen of the United States, thanks to your patronage. 
I am a wealthy citizen of the United States. I'm an influential citizen of the United States. Not everybody can like pull up a live stream and have thousands of people watching them, right? Um, I pay lots and lots of taxes to the United States. <laughs> so much in taxes. And I'm, I'm usually happy to. I'm not so happy about it right now. So, because I am who I am, I am a party to the conflict that is unfolding. Not a direct party, but I am a party. I am very, I am, I am close to what's happening. And my work, everything I do, you know, um, what I'm doing right now, making money, like I'm, I am funding disproportionately one side of this conflict. That is just the truth. Okay. I, what I'm doing right now, what I'm doing right now is helping to fund and arm the Israeli side of the present conflict. <sighs> Therefore, it is appropriate for me to morally scrutinize the behavior of what is, in effect, my side in a conflict, right? It's my side, whether I want it to be or not, whether I wanted to, whether I signed up for it or not, sure as hell didn't, sure as hell didn't sign up to be on this side, but here I am. And there's things that I could do to remove myself from this side. I could, I could emigrate. I could just go to another country, go pay my taxes somewhere else, right? Um, so I see a lot of people in the chat asking a lot of like specific questions about the conflict, and I may answer some of them. But like, and if you want to talk about this among yourselves, that's fine. But I have a thing that I want to say, and I'm gonna keep saying it, and you can pay attention to that, or you can pay attention to each other, and that's. That's all, it's all good. I, I, I have a side in this conflict. What I'm doing right now is funding the Israeli military. Um, therefore, it is incumbent upon me to be more, it is incumbent upon me to direct my moral gaze toward my side. Or it is more incumbent upon people on me to do that is more incumbent upon me to scrutinize what my side is doing for purposes of moral rectitude for purposes of strategy or tactics or whatever that's a completely different conversation but in terms of like figuring out what what should we do in terms of doing the right thing yeah i think it's appropriate that i scrutinize what is in effect my side more than i scrutinize other sides so that is how i try to relate to this issue in terms of my own moral calculations. I don't want to borrow trouble. I don't need to think, I don't need to scrutinize moral quandaries that are not before me, that are not at my table, right? I don't need to wrestle over puzzles that I am not expected to solve. There are moral quandaries on the Palestinian Arab side of this conflict that are enormous but they are internal to that community. I follow them with great interest, but ultimately it's not my conversation, right? Um, that is an internal conversation among other people that they have to work out for themselves. It's better for me to focus on what is in effect my internal conversation. Similarly, with knives, like I can't control how people... I. Let me put it this way. I don't know what the best way to cut is. <laughs> I really don't. I don't know what the best way to keep people safe is. I can't borrow that trouble. Like I can't, the, stressing over an unknown that I cannot answer is trouble that I am borrowing a lot of the time and I am trying not to just do my thing. Similarly, I do not have to figure out the entire moral quandary that is the 
thousands years long conflict over that strip of land. I, I can, I have the privilege to focus on that piece of the puzzle that I have influence over. And that is the United States government and its enormous support of the state of Israel. I'm now going to talk a little bit about what I think about the, that support and what we should do about it. And I am not looking at the chat. <laughs> Sorry, somebody just asked in the chat, like, did, do, did this, am I, do I have a gun at my head? Does this feel forced? In a way, it's forced because I, I don't really want to talk about this. You know, this is no one wants, to, not a lot of people do want to talk about this. Um, but we're in a place where, like, I, I think, you know, it's just morally incumbent upon someone like me to talk about this. And I don't know how to do it. There's no way to do it perfectly. So I decided to just run headlong into the problem and live stream my way through it. So that's what's happening. I understand that people are going to get salty about it, but you know, hey, salt can be good. As in the case of Element, sponsor of this episode, go to drinklmnt.com slash Adam to get a free flavor pack with any purchase. Drinkelement.com slash Adam, free flavor pack with any sample purchase. Element is a delicious electrolyte drink. Um, that is to say a drink that contains the electricity conducting, some of the electricity conducting elements that we all need to survive. It has sodium, potassium, and magnesium in a scientifically backed proportion to help you replenish yourself from say strenuous exercise. When you sweat out a lot of your salt, that's when you really, really need a uh, 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 a replenishment of your electrolytes. Also, if you're uh, eating really cleanly, you know, you're not eating any processed foods or anything, you're on a really strict diet, it's you could easily end up going uh, low salt in that case, which would make you feel sort of uh, in the initial stages, kind of like low, low energy, a little sick to your stomach, foggy. But of course, when you get uh, really low on electrolytes, then you just lose all musculo muscular control and you just collapse in a heap, which is something you may have seen at endurance sports events when people run out of their electrolytes. <laughs> Regardless, um, you know, there, there are things you can buy, sports drinks and stuff on the market for replenishing your electrolytes, but they have a lot of sugar and a lot of other stuff that you might not want. The whole thing about Element is that uh, it's a really, really simple thing with a really simple list of ingredients. It just has sort of the electrolytes and some natural flavorings and that's it. So this is the grapefruit salt flavor, which is my favorite, but they have a lot of delicious flavors. Mm. Mix it in however much water you want. You're good to go. Go to drinkelement.com slash Adam. Element is spelled L-M-N-T. So it's drinkelement.com slash Adam to get a free flavor pack with any purchase. And I thank element very much. So, <laughs> so I see someone say, uh, well, I'm not going to engage with that. So this is my job, folks. This is what I do. I do podcasts and I support those podcasts with advertising. And, uh, and we have to be able to talk about whatever is important on this show, I think. So here we go. <sighs> Um, if we look at the most recent stage of the conflict in a bottle, it, the, the scale and brutality of, of the Hamas breakout is so enormous that I think it's completely unrealistic for anyone to expect that there would be something other than a really powerful military response, right? this is one of these don't borrow trouble situations. You can, you know, fight all day about whether or not a military response is, is warranted morally. It will happen in the same way that it was completely, you know, anyone who had any sense at all looked at the situation in Gaza prior to this most recent phase, looked at people who were in effect being held in an open air refugee camp. Well, I guess all our, Refugee camps are open air. I guess what I meant is open air prison. I think that's maybe too strong a word to use, but in effect, people are being held in a refugee camp. Um, that, that, that people in that situation are going to break out and fight back in any way they can. Whether it's right or wrong is an important, com 
is not an unimportant conversation. Right and wrong always matter, but it is not the most important conversation at the moment. The most important conversation at the moment is what is and is not true. What is true is that people living in a political and security situation like they have been living in in Gaza in recent years, it is unrealistic to expect that they won't lash out violently. They will. It will happen. Similarly, when an incursion into a nation's you know, self-perceived sovereign territory happens that results in the deaths of thousands of civilians, horrible deaths of thousands of civilians, it is completely ridiculous to think that there won't be some kind of profound military response. There will be. And so for me, I think it's good for me to start start from the place of what is true. And what is true is that these things have happened. It's also true that the United States is Israel's daddy for various historical and cultural reasons and economic reasons and military reasons. I'm not sure I want my country to radically change its relationship to the state of Israel right now. Like I kind of think that I'm open to the possibility that I'm open to the possibility that the way that the United States can help the situation best in this moment is to remain Israel's daddy and therefore try to keep Netanyahu's government on some kind of leash. I, I choose, no, I hope that there's a lot more going on diplomatically behind the scenes than is apparent to the eye, that the United States is perhaps actually more supportive of what the Netanyahu government is doing publicly than it is privately. I think that's probably the case that the United States is more supportive publicly than it is privately. And that may be the most productive role for the United States to fulfill at this point in the conflict. Like I'm not saying I want the U S to just wash its hands of Israel. But on the other hand, I think so much blood has been shed. So much blood has been shed that I, I, I have to join other people in my sphere of influence in calling for a ceasefire and calling for the United States government to use the levers of power that it has, which are very big levers indeed to call for to create a ceasefire in this conflict i think enough people have been killed when in doubt stop killing is that a good rule to go with when in doubt stop problem of course is that some people aren't in doubt a lot of people a lot of moral certainty i am not in a position to tell them that their moral certainty is false right um i i i am ple i am comfortably removed from the reality of most of what i'm talking about therefore i I'm not in a position to tell people that their perception of moral attitude is false or not. Again, I'm only in a position to figure out my own situation. And here is my situation. I am funding one of the sides that's shooting. There are legitimate military goals to be pursued, I think. Release rescue of hostages. Yes, legitimate military goal. 
how many children, how many uninvolved children are you willing to kill in that, in, in that pursuit? If it's my child who's been taking, who's been taken a uh, hostage, the answer is all of them. Kill them all. Burn them. Bur I will burn this world to the ground with all of you in it to save my children. That is the truth. I don't, I don't say that with pride. I actually, I don't say that. I mean, I, again, don't borrow trouble. Don't morally, don't bother morally uh, interrogating things that are immovably true. And that is immovably true. I will protect my children at the expense of every single one of you and myself. And I imagine that most human beings feel that way. And that's why we don't have directly involved parties participate in justice in a civilization. That's why. That's why we don't have the dad whose daughter has been murdered choose the punishment. We, you don't. Other less involved parties have to step in. I don't, for the people who are just have blood in their eyes in this conflict on all sides, I feel you, man. I can't, I can't, I can't imagine feeling any other way in your situation. I don't really blame you for what you do. In the same way that, you know, I, on a moral level, if Native Americans, the descendants of Native Americans who had previously held this land in East Tennessee that I quote unquote own right now and from which I'm coming to you, if people, if, if people descended from those Native people came here and said, get off our land, this is mine. They showed up at my front door with a weapon and said, get out, this is ours. I would like on a moral level, I would, I would kind of see their point. I would kind of think, yeah, yeah. I kind of get where you're coming from, man. Similarly, if descendants of, of enslaved of African slaves in the United States showed up at my door and said, you are in possession of wealth that our ancestors were, 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 were compelled through force of violence to help generate, give it back. I think I would kind of understand where they were coming from like morally like i would be like yeah yeah i, I feel you i get that but i still would protect my property i would protect my family i would protect our possessions i would protect in as much as i could right w wouldn't you like there's a certain there's this like floor of self-preservation that everyone has to me and all moral and ethical considerations are like above that floor right um there's or i guess there's people who would argue otherwise pacifists who would say that you know you remain true to your principles even if it in, involves sacrificing your life and i'm i admire that point of view i don't share it but i admire it I continue to find the situation incredibly morally confusing, but I don't have to figure it out. I only have to figure out my part in it. And I, I wonder if all of you who are with me now would take a second and think about what is your part of it, right? Like what is, what hand do you have in what's unfolding? What I have decided based upon what my hand, what my hand is doing in this conflict, what I have decided is that I want my government to probably at this moment do what I think it's doing, which is support Israel publicly, work really hard behind the scenes to restrain Israel and to try to protect Palestinian civilians in as much as possible. I think, I hope 
That's what the U.S. government is doing. I'm aware that that's probably a really rosy assessment of the situation, but I also don't have any way of knowing much more than what I've laid out, right? But I want to stop funding this war that is showing signs of metastasizing into a genocide. I do not want any part in that. And on the one hand, as a member of the United States, it, as a citizen of the United States, it's easy to kind of throw up your hands and say, well, uh, I'm just going to, we're going to be a normal country, right? We're just going to worry about ourselves and our own internal issues. And, you know, we'll worry about the rest of the world in as much as like global trade is, you know, our own core interests, blah, 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 blah. We'll just be a normal country that looks out for ourselves. You want to have a war over there? That's fine. Do it. Fine. That's not a, that's neither a practically nor morally tenable position from the United States's perspective. I don't think from a practical position, just, you know, we're too dependent on the globalized system and the globalized system is going to be too destabilized if we retreat as the global strong man. And there will always be a strong man in charge of things. There's always a dude with a gun who's in charge of things at the end of the day. That's what my reading of human history tells me. The best thing you can hope for is that the guy with a gun lets you elect his successor. I don't know, guys. From a practical standpoint, the United States can't simply wash its hand of the situation. From a moral standpoint, we can't because we've simply, we're just too up to our eyeballs in it. We've funded too much of what's happening now. Too many of our weapons are being used. Too much of our money is being used. We're up to our eyeballs in it. And I don't want to be anymore. Or I don't want to be supporting. I'm pretty sure I've decided for myself that I, I'm not. I only want to support the present Israeli government in as much as I think that that might be the most productive way for my country to influence events at this particular moment. Right. But long term, I'm really I'm kind of done here. Um. It seems to me that the present Israeli government is just, at best, they're closing their eyes and going, la, 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 la. We can pretend that we can, instead of integrating Palestinian Arabs into our state and giving them full political rights and suffrage, which would therefore allow them to vote us out of power and therefore would end the, the identity of Israel as a Jewish state, right? So... He knows he can't guy like Netanyahu is looking at the, all of the territory that his military controls sees that his, what he, his people, his voters are in the minority in that territory. Therefore he cannot extend full political rights to everyone within that territory because he will lose power. And indeed that event could result in another genocide. And that's, that's a reality that we need to, think about and take steps to forestall. On the other hand, Netanyahu, a guy like Netanyahu can't just say, well, let's let, let's, let's cordon off all of, you know, as many Palestinian Arabs as we can in these two territories. And we will create security barriers around them. And we will say, this is your state. This is where you have political rights. You don't have political rights in our territory. You have political rights in this territory that you don't actually control. You don't really have sovereignty, sovereignty over it, but this is going to be where your political rights will be expressed. Therefore, that's how we can get away with not giving you real political rights to affect the outcome of the elections of the government that actually controls your fate, which is the Israeli government, which controls those territories. So it's this from the from a, the perspective of a guy like Netanyahu, it's this it's this situation where he just wants everybody to sit around and wait for the fundamentals of the situation to change, which they won't. Or what he wanted to do was to get everybody as angry as possible to result in an explosion and in the war that he's always wanted. And I think on some level that is what's going on with a guy like that. And I do not want to fund a guy like that. If I looked at the chat right now, there would probably be a million things 
a lot of people pointing out all of the horrendous moral conduct happening on the Hamas side and the Palestinian Arab side and blah, 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 blah. Not going to engage with it because it's not my place to. I have to think through my part in the conflict. And the Israeli side is my side. Therefore, it is my side to scrutinize, my side to try to influence as best I can. And that is the calculation that I have arrived at. If that is useful to anybody out there, I hope so. If it was, if you were just curious to know like what Adam Ragusea thinks about all of this, that's probably about as much as I feel comfortable telling you. And there it is. God, it all just sucks so much. I like that I like that I, I've created like a job for myself. I like that I've created a job for myself where I can do fun things and serious things. I'm a person who is interested in both fun things and serious things. Um, unfortunately, sometimes the fun things and the serious things in my job have to come into an uncomfortably cro close proximity. And, and the, th this is one of the moments that we're at. So here's what I would like to do. Here's what I would like to do. I would like to spend the remainder of our time together this morning talking about like fun stuff. So folks in the chat be thinking about, you know, any kind of food or anything, anything that's fun that you want to talk about for the next 20 minutes. While I sincerely thank the other sponsor of this program. And before I, I, I bring them up, Please keep in mind that even though advertising in proximity to conversations about genocide may seem crass, um, the sponsor is what created the table at which we are sitting right now. We can't have these conversations together unless someone pays for the table at which we sit. And having worked in traditional media before I did this and having seen the business model completely melt under our feet and seeing the enormous damage that that has done, that the, 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 the evaporation of traditional news media, the, especially on the local level in the United States, that the, the enormous civic damage that has done to us all of the conversations we used to have about whether or not a certain revenue stream in the newspaper business was ethical. Oh my God, how quaint those conversations are. That's borrowing trouble. Let me tell you first, just make sure that you can run your newspaper first. I just have to make sure that I can run my podcast and then we can talk about serious stuff or fun stuff, but nothing happens without sponsors. And to that end, I am very glad to thank the folks at trade coffee, go to drinktrade.com slash Adam show to get a free bag of coffee with any subscription purchase. Um, I trade has been such a blessing in my life. Like I am a person who, um, I get, as you can tell from both the serious and the less serious parts of this conversation we've had so far today, I'm a person who is often paralyzed with choice. And when it came to like getting into coffee and deciding what kind of coffee to drink and where to get it from and blah, blah, blah. Like I, I have been paralyzed with choice my whole life. And when I found a company like trade where I could just kind of say, Hey, here's what I generally like. I like, uh, I like, you know, lighter roasts where I can really taste the bean. I like more sort of acidic tastes. I like really strong coffee. Um, uh, and I usually like to do it from whole bean, but sometimes, uh, I, I use pre-ground. I just tell trade that and they just like find stuff that they think I might like. They're not a, they're not a coffee maker. They're not a coffee wholesaler. What they are is just a network. They, they, they go out, they find great independent coffee roasters in the United States. They sample their coffee. They decide things that they think are good. And then they sort of develop this database of coffees that are the right taste and type for certain kinds of people with certain kinds of tastes. And then based upon that, they send you a stream of coffee to your door as, as often as you want it that comes directly from the roaster. Like the roaster roasts the coffee uh, within 48 hours of shipping it to you. 
And freshness really matters when it comes to coffee. You get your coffee in this kind of red compostable trade bag, and then you tear it open and you see what Christmas present you got inside. Or at least that's what it's like for me, being a person who celebrates Christmas, whatever gift giving holiday you celebrate, uh, sub it in there. Um, and you just see what kind of awesome, fun thing they found for you this week. Um, it's been a, just a delight to have in my life. And it can be so in yours. Go to drinktrade.com slash Adam show for a free bag of coffee with any subscription purchase. Drinktrade.com slash Adam show. That link is in the uh, description. And I thank trade very much. Now we're going to talk about something fun. Okay. Tommy Salami proposes as a topic, breakfast burritos, breakfast burritos. Okay. I think in many ways, like the burrito is the perfect food, um, especially what I know to be the San Francisco style burrito. I mean, at least that's what it has historically been called in the United States, although not so much anymore. And now the San Francisco style burrito has just become a burrito because that's the style of burrito that has been popularized by chains like Chipotle. Um, it's the burrito that is uh, made with a steamed tortilla filled, uh, folded, and then wrapped usually in foil, something so that it steams some more and it gets kind of hot and gooey and it all kind of molds together as opposed to a burrito that you like cover in cheese and then you broil and then you eat with a knife and fork, right? Which is a delicious piece of food, but it's not a convenient, you know, working person's lunch, right? In the way that a San Francisco style burrito really is. And I'm hesitant to use that term because my guess is that like the idea of steaming a tortilla, filling it with a burrito fillings and then wrapping it in foil probably predates its invention in San Francisco or like of all places. Like, but maybe, I don't know. I, I, all I'm saying is that I have known it to be called a San Francisco style burrito. Love a San Francisco style burrito. I love the like texture, the like almost skin like texture that it has from the steaming. Right. I, I used to work at a I used to work at a, a convenience store, a very popular convenience store chain based in Pennsylvania, Altoona, Pennsylvania, that's now all through the northeastern United States called Sheets. And Sheets has a, a when I worked there, they had a steamer that we would use to steam the hot dog buns. Right. So you you'd take a hot dog bun, you would put it in the steamer, you would close the door really tight to form a, a, a steam tight seal. You press this button that forces hot steam into the box and it makes the, the hot dog bun kind of taste and smell like freshly baked bread for a few seconds, but long enough to sell the hot dog. Right. Uh, and, and it was the, it was the scariest piece of equipment in the kitchen because steam burns are incredibly painful <laughs> steam. I don't know why I think anyways, well, I guess steam gets a lot hotter than boiling water. Right. So that's one reason. And then I guess maybe because it is able to envelop all parts of you, it's able to kind of rush around you. Um, uh, that's, you know, steam burns are awful. And we just, God, we used to burn ourselves on that damn hot dog bun steamer so much. So I worry about the like Chipotle employees and whether or not they're burning themselves on their, um, tortilla steamer, which looks like a pretty similar piece of, uh, technology. But anyways, I love it because when you steam the tortilla and then you fill it up with a burrito. So like the, it's filled to the brim with fillings and it's all taut like the surface skin of the burrito is taut like, like, like skin. And so it's like biting through skin, which sounds absolutely disgusting and violent as I'm like saying it, but I find that incredibly satisfying when I bite into a San Francisco style burrito. My favorite kind was from a place called laughing planet in Bloomington, Indiana that sa sadly closed. And now I mostly get them from Chipotle, which is fine. I don't Chipotle is good. It's, it's, you sh shouldn't, shouldn't, you shouldn't, shouldn't, denigrate something just because it's a chain okay that that denies the human beings who work at that chain the pride that they should feel for their accomplishments anyways uh so the one thing that's kind of funny about like a san francisco style burrito is that it's uh it's 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 all seeds right if, it, if you get like a beans rice um like a beans and rice burrito on a wheat tortilla um that's like you would use for a burrito, generally a wheat tortilla rather than a corn tortilla or even a corn tortilla because that's also seeds. It's all seeds. Beans are seeds. Rice is seeds. Grains are seeds. Wheat is seeds. It's all seeds. It's like a it's a rod of seeds when you eat a San Francisco style burrito. Right. And I'm not sure how many more seeds I need in my diet. I'm not one of these dudes, these Internet dudes who's just like, ah, seeds are, you know, industrial seed oil is turning men into 
femboys or whatever, right? Because I think the subtext of those arguments is always that like there's something unmanly about eating seeds because birds eat seeds. Never mind that birds are dinosaurs, literally dinosaurs, and dinosaurs are pretty fucking badass. But anyways, um, so seeds. Uh, I, I, they, they, I think there's a guy on the there's a kind of guy on the internet who sort of says like eating se- implies at least that eating seeds is unmanly because birds do it, whereas men eat meat because meat requires you to kill it through an act of violence before you can eat it, and that's what a man does, right? So I'm not one of those guys. I'm just one of these guys who eats too many carbs, and so like I'm not, I'm not super. I'm trying to reduce my seed intake. So I've been trying to do breakfast burritos lately. I've been trying to like steam tortillas in the microwave, which the, to me, the basic technique that works best there is get, um, you get a, uh, paper towel wet, get a paper towel wet, wrap the tortillas in the wet paper towel, put it in the microwave for like 10 seconds, 15 seconds, maybe. And then you get a steamed tortilla. So you do that and then you put eggs in it and eggs aren't seeds. Or at least they're not botanical seeds. Eggs are basically uh, animal seeds, right? It's, it is the animal equivalent of a seed. So it's still, a, I guess you could argue a breakfast burrito is still a seed bar, <laughs> a, a, a seed rod, but it, it's still probably like better for my nutritional goals. So I've been trying to get into it, but I have a problem, which is that I have a problem with eggs and tomatoes. For some reason, eggs and tomatoes, I just, it's the acid with the egg. I don't know. It's like the acid with the kind of like farty sulfurous notes of the eggs. For some reason, that's just a really bad combination in my mind. And uh, and therefore, I, I don't want to put salsa onto my breakfast burrito. And therefore, my breakfast burritos end up being really bland. Um, however, I do use hot sauce. And hot sauce serves the function of salsa to a great extent. It provides the acidity, the piquancy. And so if you think that like a breakfast burrito is good enough, if it just has like tortilla and eggs and hot sauce, then I'm killing it on the breakfast burrito tip. I hope that you are too. So we're talking about some more fun stuff because we talked about my own feelings on the Israel Hamas war at the moment earlier in the episode. And I'm not saying that's not important. And I'm not saying that your feelings about it shouldn't be very strong. They should be very strong. I'm saying that in the remaining 10 minutes that I am going to be holding court in this particular corner of the internet, we are going to restrict ourselves to fun things to talk about because that's what's happening. So topic for Adam from Jared Mitchell. I'm interested in the truth versus common misconceptions of what high altitude does to people's health and metabolism. Wow, that is absolutely fascinating. And um, I don't know, but I I would really, I have been thinking for years about doing a, a video about high altitude baking, which is legit real. Like, like when you put stuff in the oven, or when you boil stuff, I mean, really any kind of cooking is profoundly affected by differences in barometric, by significant differences in barometric pressure, right? Because it affects the boiling point, right? So, um, you know, when you're down here closer to sea level where I am now, well, I guess I'm in the mountains, but well, no, I'm in a valley. I'm, I'm effectively just above sea level right now. So like here you have so much sky pushing down on our bodies and on the water that you're boiling to try to make your coffee or uh, sky pushing down on the cake that you're baking in your oven, right? And that effectively uh, raises the boiling point, makes it so that it takes less energy to make water boil. When you go up higher, it takes less energy to make water boil. And so stuff boils away at a lower temperature, cakes bake real weird, cakes bake real weird. It's hard to get them to brown, um, as you can imagine, because you just, you can't, You can't get them hot enough before the water starts to leave. And so there's all kinds of weird things you have to do. And the effect on like the human body is kind of similar, right? Like we have all of the sky pressing down us that's keeping all of these dissolved gases and stuff in solution in our blood and our other body fluids. And when you alter that, all kinds of like weird stuff happens. And, you know, I haven't been up to really tall mountains since I did this really regrettable. No, it's not. I won't call it regrettable. Well, maybe for them it was regrettable, but I did this like family vacation with my parents when I was 14, which like there you you have enough information to know why this was potentially a regrettable experience, right? Family vacation with a 14 year old boy, right? They were still holding on to my parents were still holding on to the idea that we were the happy family that we were a couple of years earlier when my brother and I were both adorable children and not sullen teenagers. And when we became sullen teenagers, 
yeah. So uh, anyway, they took us on this like driving vacation through the great American West, so, you know, kind of the mountain time zone. And so we went up to like, ja you know, Jackson, Wyoming and stuff like that. And I remember my overriding rem memory of that vacation is of being in the car while my dad drives us through these mountain passes with terrifying precipices down one side, right? Like you look down the side I'm like, and I'm really scared of height. My, my palms are sweating right now, just remembering this memory, right? So my palms are sweating because I'm looking down at these precipices as my dad, who's a, a spirited driver, let's say, drives us around these mountains while I am miserable because I was suffering from these horrible gas pains all the time. I, in, at the time, I thought it was basically just because I was stuck in a car with my family and I was at that age where I was too old to feel comfortable to pass gas in front of my family, but not old enough to be over it enough to feel comfortable passing gas in front of my family. I didn't want to pass gas in the car at the age of 14 and as one necessarily has to do from time to time. Right. Um, and so. I was just in just gas pain all the time on this vacation. But now when I look back on it in retrospect, I know that when people go from low altitude to high altitude, gas pain is one of the first like big acute symptoms that they experience from the pressure imbalances and, you know, ga gases that are, that were dissolved in your body fluids uh, under this, under higher pressure coming out of solution, lower pressure and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know, but that was, all you've done really a uh, person who asked that question is remind me of a really uncomfortable memory, which is good because it makes me, it, it forces me to remember that when my children transition from being absolutely wonderful little cherubic angels to being like sullen teenagers, I have to remember to not try to impose my concept of fun on them and to not expect them to come with me on my concept of fun all the time and to just give them their space to be miserable because those years are miserable for almost everyone. Most of us would be better off if they could just put us into a medically induced coma for the adolescent years, just wake up when it's over. Nothing good happens. All right, let's talk about like two more fun things before we wrap for the day. I'm going to go down in the chat, see where we are. Uh, so Joel says, are dishes that are hard to cook actually worth the hassle? Um, I will give you my opinion on this, which of course is all I can give. I mean, it's, I other other internet cooks might feel empowered to tell you what you should feel on such a topic. I will not. I will only tell you what I feel. The personal con conclusion that I have arrived at regarding the question, are hard to cook things worth it? There are two situations in which it's worth it to cook hard to cook things, in my opinion, at home. The first situation is if that food is very precious to you, you love it, and it's unavailable where you live, okay? That used to be a really common thing that came up a lot. It's less so true now. Like, wh why did I get into home pizza baking? It's because I moved to Boston. And Boston at the time, or if you went into the suburbs, there was some good pizza. But in, in sort of metro Boston, center city Boston, Cambridge, there were good pizzas, but there were no good New York style pizzas at the time. And I really missed that. So that's what I got into doing. And that's why I expended all of this work and time and money <laughs> trying to kind of bake the perfect New York pizza at home is because I could not, I literally couldn't get one and I wanted one. And it's that simple. We live in a world where at the moment, at least that eventuality is less and less common, right? Just globalism, global trade, global uh, shipping, the miracle of global uh, rapid shipping has made not all of the foods, but most of the foods available to most people in most developed countries most of the time, right? So that's less relevant. So to me, the second situation in which it's worth it to cook something hard is more relevant. And that is when it would be fun. It would be fun is a good enough reason to do almost anything that isn't particularly harmful to you or somebody else. Actually, in fact, I think it is a good enough reason to do something as long as it's a thing that isn't particularly harmful to you or someone else. You get into trouble because, you know, and this is where to tie things in with where we started our conversation today, talking about like knives and the Israel Palestine is, you know, a app when, when things, 
when things get very, when people care very much about what is going on, that tends to result in absolutist thinking, which is understandable, but not necessarily productive. So the absolutist thinking that I tend to engage in as it comes to kind of cooking is I kind of think like, well, you know, either I'll do it myself or I'll just buy something and it's, you know, it's one or the other. The whole semi-homemade thing never had any appeal to me, right? The idea of like buying a rotisserie chicken from the grocery store and then dressing it up with stuff yourself, that never really made sense to me. It was like, I'm either going to cook or I'm not going to cook. That's absolutist thinking. That's my own kind of, my own tendency toward kind of um, all or nothing or even um, ideological thinking, you know? Um and, and that's bad. And I've kind of gotten over that. So that's not a good reason to cook yourself. Um, the other sort of absolutist thing that people tend to think about is that it's like, oh my gosh, did I just lose the train of thought? Well, hey, if that only happened once terribly over the course of this like hour long live stream, that's not terrible. That's fine. The point is when it would be fun, if it's a project, if, if, if making this hard to make thing, if making timpano or whatever weird, weirdly unnecessarily elaborate thing you want to make would just be fun to do because it would be a fun project. Hell, go for it. Okay. I am coming to you from my greenhouse where I mostly keep decorative plants, ornamental plants. I keep some plants that I eat, but not many. It's mostly ornamentals. And I keep fish in aquariums. I'm not going to eat them. It's all for fun. It's all work I have made myself for fun, right? The, the fish tank is nothing but like a homework assignment that I gave myself because projects are fun. And I also know that I, as a person, am at my best when I have a project, right? When I don't have a project, I, I, I retreat into all kinds of really unhealthy states, right? And that's why to a certain extent, like I'm choosing to be here today and talking to you and to keep doing this, to keep making content for a living, even though like I could, I'm at the point where I've made enough money with it, where I could start to kind of, I could start to sort of ramp it down a little bit. Um, I know that it's good for me to work and to have a project and do stuff. And so that's why I'm here. And if you like it, if it's enjoyable for you, that's awesome. That's a benefit. That's great, but I'm mostly here just to keep myself from melting into a like cow, uh, like chair dad, you know, like the dad who just spends his he's like he's he's he spends his whole life in his easy chair. He's sort of melt become part of it, you know, like almost like Han Solo in Carbonite, like he's just kind of part of the chair. And that dad just kind of hangs out in the background as everybody grows up and does their lives around him and he cuts the checks so people love him but he, he doesn't really do much other than that. I kind of want to be chair dad. That seems like a good, th I'm not against, I love chair dad. I've known many chair dads and they're awesome. I kind of want to be chair dad, but I feel like that's probably not the best use of me. And I also think that that's like not the best thing for my health. I need to keep going. I need to keep doing things. I need to stay busy. And so the way you do that is you give yourself projects. One project is, hey, get off your ass and make some money for the family, <laughs> which is what I'm doing here, right? But other th projects are like, hey, you know, abduct some fish from the South American stream where they were perfectly happy. Try to keep them alive in a glass box. <laughs> it's like this weird homework assignment that I gave myself, but I do it because... A, I enjoy it, and B, it, it's good for me. It keeps me sharp. It makes me healthy. Cooking something difficult keeps me sharp from time to time, makes me healthy, gives me something to do. And if it's that for you, I 10,000% support you in that, even if it's a complete waste of, it's not like a good expenditure of resources, unless you're the kind of person who really should be putting your effort towards something, like you have children that you're not providing for. I think you should go and like work at a real job instead of giving yourself a pointless homework assignment, if that's the eventuality. Um, but on the other hand, you can take that kind of reasoning too far and say that poor people don't deserve leisure, right? 
And that is uh, not the kind of argument you, you want to be making that people who are idle are, are somehow morally compromised, right? Uh, everyone needs a certain amount of downtime in their life in order to like function and be productive and useful to anyone. And so, uh, yeah, you can't, you can't criticize poor people for trying to have some fun with some of their day because they literally have to, because there's no other way we can get through it all. There's no other way we can get through all the horror that we are presented with in our daily lives without spending some time in our happy place. And if your happy place is deep frying something, even though deep frying at home is in many ways, a bad use of resources, then you do you, my friend. Find your peace however you can in this crazy world that we live in. Love y'all in as much as I can love people I don't know. Be safe out there and uh, talk to you next time. Oh, now I have to say end.